Hi, everybody. Welcome back to That's Life with John Carver. My guest today is Ronnie. Ronnie is a very longtime friend of mine. He and I went to school together way back in the 1980s, so we just aged ourselves quite a bit. Um, and Ronnie and I lost touch over the years uh, after high school, but I, I uh, got back together with Ronnie in the last uh, month or so, and I've learned of a story and a journey that he has gone through over the years that I think is going to really open your eyes and give many people some hope that have been struggling over a long time. So Ronnie, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. So if you could really start at the beginning, maybe after high school and then through the well, last if, if years. If you don't mind, I'd like to just give you a little bit of a background okay, of great. why maybe I got where I got. Okay. Um, basically, you know, I, I was raised in a typical middle class family, um, thought I had a normal upbringing, um, but we had that club basement with the bar and the, uh, the, the signs and the neon lights down there and it was very common for my family to have parties all the time and that was just a regular way and as a child I remember thinking well I'm never going to drink like that and I'm never going to smoke or anything like that but it turned out entirely different. Um, I also like to mention that I'm gay and the reason I bring that up is it's a big part of my story. Um, when I was younger, I always thought that, you know, that was terrible and I wasn't supposed to be the way I am. And, and then at the right age of puberty, uh, 13 and 14 years old, um, my parents both passed away 11 months apart. And I really thought that God had taken them from me because I was gay and that I caused their deaths. Uh, this made me, uh, put me in a depression for a few years. Um, and just kind of made me a loner and stuck to myself until high school where in my senior year I was invited to a few senior parties where that was the first time I ever tasted alcohol and it just gave me a new sense of being someone special it made me feel on top of the world and um, I, I just thought I had arrived but right from the beginning I have to say blackouts started because I remember after the first few times that I drank at those parties, I was in school a few days later asking people, what did I do? Did I say anything wrong? Did I do anything wrong? And I found out that I hadn't, so, so I was happy about that, but I still knew I drank heavily, but it didn't affect me. I thought, well, everybody does this. Fast forward, I went to college um, a few years later. And um, that, I tell people, uh, you know, I paid $15,000 a year to learn how to professionally party. Um, I had roommates that uh, introduced me to marijuana and also uh, drinking. And there were fraternities and uh, sororities that had parties every night. And uh, basically, I thought I was partying like everybody else. But again, there were blackouts. Um, I remember one morning waking up and finding out that my my roommate said, thanks a lot, and I said, thanks for what? And he said, well, you, you, open, you, you obviously came in my room and opened up my dresser and um, you urinated all over my underwear. I was like, oh, sorry about that. But these are, these are memories I, you know, I try to forget, but these should have been signs that something was wrong. But again, I just thought I was just a kid. Oh, this is funny, funny, this is all, this is all cool. And then I got a little older, and um, when I got out of college, I came home and I partied with two girls from high school and finally I got sick of being in the closet and I came out and when I came out I, I started going to bars downtown and I thought I had discovered life and I remember not being able to afford enough, uh, to drink because the drinks were so expensive so I'd put a, a, a pint of uh, Bacardi in my pocket and keep it inside my, my pocket and just order a coke but many nights my sister used to tell me, she raised me after my parents had passed, and she used to tell me, Ronnie, you're playing Russian roulette, because I was drinking and driving continually, coming home and saying, did I park the car okay, type of thing. And then, um, you know, years went on, and I thought everything was fine. I, I started having lovers, and, and uh, one night I remember following somebody home, and I had a hit and run. I ran right into a car that was parked in the ice and just backed up and called the insurance company the next day, said somebody backed into me. That was one thing I did. And then uh, at 28, I actually was in an argument at a bar, and um, 
That night, I got in the car, I was angry, and I, I cruised down a uh, street in Baltimore and took a left on a green light when I should have yielded and I didn't. And they, it, a truck put me into a 360 spin and I ended up in a telephone pole. Um, I thank my, my God above that I didn't die and that I didn't kill anybody, but that really opened my eyes to the drinking and driving. It should have opened my eyes to the drinking, but it didn't. It opened my eyes to the drinking and driving. So I, I said, well, you know, I won't drink and drive anymore. And it also, I, I had totaled my car, so I, I didn't have a ride. And then on, I, I had to take buses and cabs um, to work. At the time, I was working as a portrait studio photographer. And um, I remember uh, going out at night and, you know, a lot of times calling out of work, but most of the time showing up. But I remember my sales consultant telling me a lot of times, woo, you had a night last night, you smell like rum. So they could smell the liquor on me back then. And I still didn't think anything of it, just was my way of life. Um, I got a little older and um, basically I finally got a car back. I became a karaoke host, and I, I, I said, I'll never, I'll never drink and drive again. Well, that turned into a two-drink limit instead, and I started having, well, I can have two. I can have two, and I would, I would uh, you know, have two, and I'd be fine. And, and that went on for years and years. And basically, um, fast forward a little bit, I, I started... Uh, realizing that my drinking was was getting out of hand. Um, I, I met my husband um, that I've been with for 18 years now at the age of 32. Um, the night I met him, we partied together and we continued on for years doing that. We still didn't drink and drive, but after just two years of being with him, I got my second DWI. I was 37 years old, so not quite 10 years later. This was no accident, but basically it was a, a eye opener that um, you know put me in right turn of Maryland, which was a facility in Owings Mills for a weekend. And when I came out of there, I really realized that I had a problem, that drinking was an issue. And I came home to him and I said, I can't do this without you, we've got to stop. And if you don't do it, I can't do it. And he basically said to me, he's not stopping. Um, I, instead of leaving or, or doing my own thing, I just said, you can't beat him, join him. And uh, I continued to drink and party with him for many years to come. A um, few things I, I probably left out. I, I, I also experimented with other drugs. Um, when I was in college, we had went to Florida for a week where I stayed awake for the entire week on cocaine. I'm very glad that never became my drug of choice, but I have experimented with that. Once at college also, I, I ate an, a mushroom that was meant for a group, and I ate the whole thing, and I was actually stuck in a fetal position for uh, 24 to 48 hours. I don't remember exactly what it was, but I, I've really kind of done it all with the exception of any type of needles, which I thank God I never went there. But um, I really thought there was really no hope, and um, I, I just had, uh, had many years of, um, of what I thought was fun partying. But it got to the point where the, the partying wasn't fun anymore. Um, it was more maintenance. I, I realized uh, I wasn't, I used to just drink on weekends and then it became, well, I can have one in the in hump day, Wednesdays. So. Then it became Thursday through Sundays. And oh, what the heck, might as well have one every night. And I started drinking, it was just, uh, I'd get up in the morning, go to work. Um, I ended up doing sales, which I do now. But I'd end up getting up and, and I'd be thinking about when the last sale would end and when I could start drinking, when I could have my first drink and catch my first buzz. The, the marijuana and the drinking went hand in hand together. If I didn't have one, I, I, I wanted the other and vice versa. But most of the time, I, I wanted both. Basically, I, I never, um, a lot of people think that you have to end up in the, in the gutter or you have to lose everything to be an alcoholic or to be a drug addict. And I realize there's many different levels of, of that. Um, uh, a, a, a phrase I've heard recently is you can get off the elevator, 
that's going down on any floor you want to. You don't have to wait till it hit rock. It hits rock bottom. Um, I had an older brother that um, obviously I think I think it's hereditary. I don't know. I'm not a scientist, but. My uh, family, my dad, like I said, drank when I was young. My brother always had his beer every night. Um, and when I turned 50 last year, my, my brother, um, my brother, actually, it's been two years. When I was 50, I thought about the fact that I had lost my brother two years before um, he drank himself to death, basically, at 64, which today is not, not old. And uh, he, was, uh, he probably was 110 pounds when he died, not eating, just drinking. I, I, the drinking for me was a slow progression because I basically started, you know, like I said, partying young and, and just here and there, and then it became more often. And, and I never went to straight liquor. I always mixed my drinks. But regardless, it still became a necessity and not just fun, and it, it still became on my mind. Towards the end, I actually got to the point where I was drinking before I'd go see clients, which I didn't want to do. Um, I always said I won't drink and drive anymore. Well, now I, I'm thinking, well, I, my client's not till 7 o'clock at night. Why not have a couple before I go see that, that, that client? That was kind of a red flag to me, and uh, it, it really made me wake up. Um, August 1st last year, I did wake up, and <clears throat> I, I like to say that I, I didn't really, I didn't really uh, have a moment of, uh, like some people say the courts made them realize, or the, the family had an intervention with you. Well, I hid my drinking so well that there was no intervention. Um, everybody thought I was a normal drinker. Every, you know, I, I kept my job. No one at my job knew I drank. Um, I, 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 I isolated at home, though. Um, my husband and I, we, we just would drink nightly at home, and no, we weren't hurting anybody but ourselves. I, uh, I remember, too, thinking, because uh, it, it got to be a monotonous kind of Groundhog Day, if you've seen that movie, kind of scenario where it just felt like the same thing over and over. Um, I remember on Saturdays, we'd, we'd always say, well, next Saturday, you know, we'll go see a movie and we'll go out to dinner. Well, he'd be off on Saturdays. I'd have to run a morning appointment or so and get home in the middle of the afternoon around 2 or 3 o'clock. And when I'd get home, he'd already have three glasses of wine and caught a buzz. Well, there goes the movie. There goes, there goes the dinner. Might as well just start with him. And, Basically, every Saturday night was wandering around the house talking about what we're going to redecorate um, in a stoop, you know? What kind of life is this? Um, I'm 50. My life is probably half over. When you're 40, I say, you know, your life might not be half over. When you're 50, it probably is. Do I really want to go further with this? Do I really want to continue this journey? Um, I woke up on August 1st, um, which was a Sunday. I hadn't done anything different the night before. I hadn't fallen, which I had done many times, but I hadn't fallen, I hadn't broken anything, but I, um, I just knew that uh, something had to happen. I had been praying most of the time for God just to take me, that my life was worth nothing, and I got to the realization he wasn't listening and that I needed to do something. So I got out of bed that morning. I got up. I was in tears. I walked down the steps. I looked at my husband, and I said, I can't do it anymore. He said, do what? I said, I can't, I can't live like this. I can't drink anymore. And he said, well, you know, it's OK. You'll be OK. I said, no, I won't be OK. And I, I got in my car. I drove around the block to my sister's house, and I went in and busted out crying to her and told her, Kathy, I can't do it. And she knew exactly what I meant because she has her own issues. And she hugged me and she said, you don't have to do it alone. And I said, I can't do it alone and I can't do it here. 
I knew I couldn't stay in that environment and be successful at getting rid of, of this addiction. And uh, so we got on the phone and we started calling uh, facilities. Um, insurance companies very hard to get a hold of on Sundays. For sure. And I ended up um, basically finally finding a place, uh, a rehab that would take me, but they couldn't take me until that following Friday. And um, I basically uh, said, are you sure? Because I wanted it now. And they said to me, um, no, we can take you on Friday. So what did I do? Um, like any good alcoholic, I went to the liquor store. I've got four days left to party my brains out. So I did that. But my sobriety date is August 5th, 2016. That's the day I entered the rehabilitation center. It was the best choice I ever made. I uh, went in there with an open mind. Um, I was scared, but uh, by the time I got out in 28 days, I didn't want to leave. Um, it was a wonderful program, and it was like a shell that kind of teaches you how to, what you have to do. So. I probably left a lot out, but I mean, any questions for me, John? That well, I remember when we talked uh, a few weeks back that there was a time that you were in a phone booth. If you could kind of explain, I know we're going back in time now. But That's okay. That's okay. Like I said, I left a lot out. I thought um, that was interesting. Yeah. Well, it wasn't even a phone booth. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. When I was younger, during the days when I was really um, getting myself a uh, in trouble or after the, when I, when I was no longer driving, right after the, the DWI, uh, the first one where I totaled the car, I was doing a lot of cabbing it. And I guess one night I didn't, I didn't, um, I, I don't know how I ended up there, but I didn't get home. Um, instead, I woke up underneath of a payphone on 33rd Street downtown with the sun in my face. So that was, should have been a sign. <laughs> that something was, was up. Um, I also have broke, broken, broken both of my ankles um, due to alcohol. Uh, one was in a fight with a lover. Another time I was at a pool party where I simply took a step the wrong way and fell. Um, I did all that. Oh, I also have um, a finger that's shorter than the other. Um, that was done, that was at uh, that, that was later. That was not too long ago. Probably two years ago. I was at a bar, standing outside the bar, smoking a cigarette, and had my hand on the door jam. And someone opened that metal door really quick, and it took the tip of my finger off. Um, yeah, they it, it fell on the floor, and a friend of mine. I couldn't believe he was kind enough, but he picked it up and he put it in a glass, a cup of ice. And they rushed me to the hospital. But the thing was, I didn't feel it. I didn't feel it. Wow. I mean, this shows the amount of liquor that I could hold. Um, I, was, I was totally numb. I went in the bar, and it looked like something out of a horror movie, because I'm just holding my hand, and blood is squirting out of my finger. What's up? What's wrong? Why is everybody looking at me? <laughs> <laughs> and they, um, oh my gosh. they took me to the hospital, where my good friend, good friend decided to uh, videotape me at the hospital oh um, and I was simply walking around um, the room I didn't want to sit still because I was still feeling good and saying just get this over with and from now on don't call me Ronnie call me Stubbly <laughs> <laughs> That's, and, and then they put that on Facebook so oh, you gotta love no. you gotta love your friends oh, so basically no. they yeah you know, they call me Stubbly so these things it's good once once you're you're sober you can look back and, and laugh at a lot of the things you did. Mm. Um, you know, that, that's the only thing. I think it's the only way to keep your sanity. I mean, you, you, you can't live in yesterday. You, you can't live with your regrets, which I have a lot of. I mean, I, I lost a job with, with NSA due to marijuana. Wow. Um, yeah, yeah. In high school, they actually came and tested us, and, and I was one of the 12 selected, and they told us you couldn't smoke pot and get into NSA and I just didn't take it seriously and I smoked pot and they caught me and wow. really yeah my whole life could have been different from For high sure. school if For I sure. hadn't uh, you know if I hadn't went to NSA every time I drive by there on route 32 I think wow 
what would have life been? <laughs> but um, it wasn't meant to be, and I have to I have to realize now that um, I I you know there's a I've always believed in a higher power. I've always believed in God. Um, as, I, as I've gotten older, though, I, I, like I said, I was mad at him when I was young for taking my parents. But as I got older, I started feeling like I was doing nothing but ask for forgiveness every day. It, it could, could, would you forgive me, God? Would you forgive me, God, for, for what I do, for what I think, what I do? Because I was leaving, I was basically leading a self-indulgent life. Everything was me, me, me. Drinking is, alcoholism is a disease, but it is a self-centered, egotistical disease that m m you think of no one else but you. Um, I thought I was doing nothing wrong because I'm paying my bills, I have a job, I have a house, I'm not hurting anybody, but I'm also not doing anything for society or for anybody else. Hmm. Um, imagine if every individual on the planet felt like that. We wouldn't get very far, would we? <laughs> so fortunately, the, the programs and the counseling I've gotten involved in have taught me a lot about finding myself. Drinking is but drinking and drugs are but a symptom of what what you really uh, what the problems really are. Um, once you take away the alcohol then you have to examine yourself. And that, I think that's why we drink or we drug. You don't ever want to examine yourself. You, don't, you can't see yourself without, without that drink or without that drug. One of my friends said to me right after I had decided to go into the rehab, everybody else is like, Ronnie, that's great. You, you're courageous. You're doing the right thing. But one of my friends said to me, I'm sorry. When I told her, I said, you're sorry? She said, yeah, I'm sorry for you, because I know you're, you're losing your best friend. And I said, you know, I didn't think wow. of it like that, but wow. it, is, it is true. It, something you've done for, for 30 years, it's been there every day for 30 years, and it's true. Early on, I, I will never say that I didn't have some good times. Um, there's a lot of people that'll say, well, my, my worst day sober is better than my best day drunk. Uh, I say, oh, yeah, bull. <laughs> <laughs> no, there were some really good times. But um, I, the, the main thing is I, I, it, it progresses. It is a progressive disease that, that takes, that, that at first you feel like you have it to make you happy. And then later, it has you. Um, it, it basically, like I said, I was either dr in the end, I was either drinking or thinking about drinking. Um, if you find yourself in that position where you would, you, you're you're either using or you're thinking about using, you probably have an issue. Um, the normal, there are normal drinkers out there. Boy, don't they upset us, make us mad. Um, the person that really goes and has one or two drinks, that, and, or, 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 you know, and they just, or they leave alcohol in a glass, that's alcohol abuse. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't have done that that way, right? That, that's just alcohol abuse. Oh See, how could somebody leave alcohol in a glass? But, but you know, there's just questions. The, the biggest thing you have to do, I think, um, to, to, to address the problem is first be honest. I mean, um, I think John and I told you about a song I had heard. Um, it's called If We're Honest. Uh, Francesca Battistelli sings it. It's on 95 Shine. And it's just a beautiful, beautiful song. And the words in the song um, basically talk about um, letting go. And, and, and if you're honest, there's mercy waiting on the other side. But the first step is to be honest with yourself. If you don't, if you, if you don't say it out loud, you know, I'm Ronnie and I'm an alcoholic, and that's never going to change. I'm never, I can never say I used to be an alcoholic. Um, the same thing with drug addicts and addi addicts. You're, once, once you're there, you're there. You're never going to be able to go back. 
it's a disease, it's also an addiction, and it's, it, it's also, it's like an allergy. If somebody took, if you knew every time you ate peanuts that well you broke out, you wouldn't eat peanuts. Well said. But um, y you, you know every time you go to, to drink or you go to drug, it, it's not going to just end with that. It, mm. It's going to progress. That's powerful stuff. And, and you know, once you, once you know it's there, if you're honest with yourself, you, you, you not only don't have to do it alone, you shouldn't do it alone. The chances of getting sober and making your life better just on your willpower, slim to none. That's why there are recovery centers. That's why there are recovery hotlines. There is life. Alcoholism, like I said earlier, is progressive. The best thing I have found, sobriety is also progressive. It's big time. The longer you are sober, the longer you work a program, the further away from that drink you are. You only have to get one sobriety date, you don't have to do it again, and you realize there is life after the drinking, there is life after the drugs, and it's a great life. Somebody once said to me, you know, you can drink or you can do anything else. Hey, there's a thought. And it's so true. And now that, I, now that I'm sober, I'm here with you. Um, I'm going to speak at my re rehabilitation center next week. Um, my job, I'm in sales. I'm doing better than I've ever done. Um, and I give it all to him. I give it all to God. And uh, I couldn't do it on my own, but he put me in the group of people that I need to be with. And find those people, find the help you need, because you're not going to do it alone, but it can be done. I'm living proof. Ronnie, thank you so much for being on the show today. Folks, thanks for being here. I hope this information is going to inspire many of you who have struggles of various kinds. His courage, hopefully, is going to inspire you to take some very big steps in your life. Thanks for watching That's Life with John Carver, and we'll see you next time. I think it went well. I think it went well, too. Appreciate that a lot. It's awesome, man.